Hey guys, welcome back. Apple just had their first big product event of the year where they announced a bunch of new hardware updates to the iPhone, iPad and Mac lineup. So this is my reactions and thoughts to this peak performance event as they called it, with a rundown of all the major announcements, so let's get right into it. Starting with the iPhone, Apple announced two brand new colours for the iPhone 13s. Green for the 13 and an Alpine green for the 13 Pro. And I'm not one who usually goes for the coloured versions of iPhones, I tend to just stick to black or white. But these new colours, uh, particularly the Alpine green, are really gorgeous. It's got a real rustic forest feel to it and it just looks stunning in the photos. Very reminiscent of the iPhone 11's midnight green. The 13's green is slightly darker than the Alpine, but both sit well with the rest of their respective lineups. Next up is the new third generation iPhone SE. The SE is Apple's attempt at making a more affordable iPhone, as affordable as they can without compromising on things like build quality. But this time there's no updated design, it's still using the iPhone 8 body which is looking pretty dated in 2022 with that massive forehead and chin. Plus the home button. This and the base iPad are keeping the home button alive by being the only products left in Apple's lineup that use them. The only change on the outside is the new tougher glass on the front and the back. Otherwise there's not really much to see, it has the exact same body, design and screen as the previous SE. But inside there's some new internals. It has the same super fast A15 Bionic chip as the latest iPhone 13, which compared with the iPhone 8 offers a 1.8 times boost in CPU performance, and up to three times faster than the iPhone 6S. When it comes to graphics performance for things like gaming, it's 1.2 times faster than the previous SE, a modest increase, 2.2 times faster than an iPhone 8, 3.7 times faster than an iPhone 7, and a massive 5 times faster than the iPhone 6S. So if you are on an older iPhone and looking to upgrade on a budget, the new SE might be the one for you. While the camera hardware is again identical to the SE2, the A15 chip enables a couple of new camera features this time around like deep fusion for better mid to low light shots, smart HDR4 for even better dynamic range, and photographic styles as seen on the iPhone 13 which lets you create and fine tune the look of all of your photos. Interestingly though, there's no night mode here which is a bit of a missed opportunity and it would have been a nice feature to have. The SE3 now gets 5G connectivity for even faster downloads if you live in a 5G area. If you do, it will be great for streaming video on the go or FaceTime calls. And when you don't need all that speed, it will shift into smart data mode to help preserve battery life. And speaking of battery, there's some nice improvements here thanks to the more efficient chip. Up to two hours more video playback time than iPhone SE2, the iPhone 8 and iPhone 7, and four hours more than the iPhone 6S. The third generation SE comes in midnight, starlight and product red colours, which are subtly different from the old black, white and the previous product red, at least in Apple's promo shots. Pricing now starts at $430 or £420 for 64 gigs, a slight increase over the last generation. And bear in mind, there's no charging plug in the box either this time round to cut down on environmental waste, so you are going to need to fork out extra if you need one. Overall, the new SE might be a little bit disappointing for some current SE2 owners. There's no new design and only some modest performance boosts. But for older iPhone users, if you can get over the slightly dated design, then it's a pretty solid choice. A fast performing, single rear camera, no frills device that has you covered for all the basics. And you can rest easy knowing that you'll get a bunch of software updates and support in the years to come, which Apple is known for. Next up, Apple announced the brand new 5th generation iPad Air, and following on from the SE, the new Air is pretty much identical on the outside compared to last year's redesign. The same iPad Pro inspired design, but with Touch ID in the power button. There are some new colours though, there's Starlight which is a bit too goldish or creamy looking for my personal liking, I prefer the old silver and white, but it might look better in person a softer pink, a purple and a blue which is really nice, I think it's my favourite of all of them. Plus space grey is still there which is always a safe neutral choice. The screen is the exact same as before but that's not really a bad thing. The 10.9 inch liquid retina display has true tone, 
500 nits of max brightness and P3 wide colour. Which is all pretty good I think, considering where the Air sits in the rest of the iPad lineup. But there's no 120Hz ProMotion, that's still reserved only for the iPad Pros. So what is new? Well, Apple went all out on the chip in this iPad. Last year's Air had the A14 Bionic, which is by all means no slouch, and this year they're swapping it out for an M1 chip. The same M1 chip as in the iPad Pro, the MacBook Air, the 13-inch MacBook, and the Mac Mini, which is pretty nuts really. The 8-core CPU delivers up to 60% faster performance than the previous generation, and it's going to make everything from gaming, photo editing, 3D modeling, or whatever you get up to on your iPad, feel a lot faster. Basic tasks like browsing should benefit too, but at the level of performance that the Air was at already, it's going to be a lot more noticeable on the more intensive stuff. But with all this power, I do feel like putting an M1 in an iPad Air or iPad Pro is a bit of a waste. It's a bit like putting a supercar Lamborghini engine in, you know, a four-door family car. It's just a bit overkill iPadOS has definitely been improving in recent years with things like better multitasking, but I am still waiting for a killer app to really use that power. Putting an M1 in the air and matching it with the iPad Pro has got me wondering about what chip Apple will use in the next iPad Pro. How are they going to top it, like with an M1 Pro or an unannounced M2? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Either way, I really hope that Apple unleashes iPadOS and allows it to really make use of all that power. Hopefully we'll see this year at WWDC in the summer. Other hardware improvements come with the new front camera, which is now a 12 megapixel ultra wide, up from the 7 megapixel wide last year. And now it has center stage like the rest of the iPad lineup. So it will crop in and pan and zoom around to track and follow people as they come in and out of frame on a FaceTime call, which is a really nice feature. For connectivity, if you go for the cellular iPad Air, it will now come with 5G for even faster download speeds. The USB-C port also gets a performance boost, making data transfer speeds twice as fast now. Great if you use external storage for large RAW files or video files. The new 5th gen Air starts at $600 or £570 for the Wi-Fi model with baseline storage of 64 gig, which I do feel, to be honest, is a little bit on the small side. If you stream a lot of films and don't download them for offline playback, then I think you'll be okay. But if you do need a lot of storage space for using your iPad more creatively for editing photos or storing lots of films when traveling, then go for the 256 gig. If you have last year's Air, then there's probably not enough here for you to want to upgrade, but once again, for older Air owners or students, I think, will really get a lot out of this new iPad. It's thin, light, and incredibly powerful for such a small form factor. Lastly, Apple announced a few bits of Mac hardware. A brand new display, a brand new desktop computer, and their most powerful chip yet to power it. As you've probably heard, Apple are currently in the process of transitioning all of their Intel Macs over to their own Apple Silicon chips. And this is almost complete now. This event they just held, Apple called it peak performance, which turns out is a little bit of a play on words as they used it to announce their most powerful, their peak performing new chip in the M1 family, the M1 Ultra. And this thing is really crazy. Built from two M1 Max chips, the M1 Ultra has a 20-core CPU, an up to 64-core GPU, and it supports up to 128 gigs of unified memory with a memory bandwidth of 800 gigabytes a second, doubling the maximum spec of the M1 Max, all while still being incredibly energy efficient. So what kind of crazy, monstrously big pro-level workstation is this for? Well, Apple's putting it in this. They call it the Mac Studio, named after the personalized workspaces that creators, designers, and scientists use to change the world, as Apple put it. You can think of this new Mac as like an in-between of the Mac Mini, which it does kind of look like a, a few stacked together, and an iMac, which is often the go-to for users in these industries. Designed for professionals who need more than what a Mac Mini can offer, but in the same form factor that still lets them choose their own display and setup. Also, I say in between, but this M1 Ultra chip is so powerful that it outperforms even a maxed out iMac Pro. It even beats out high configurations of the Mac Pro 2, which is just crazy really. 
all in a computer that sits in this 20 by 10 centimeter box on your desktop, which is pretty wild and mind blowing. And to keep such a high performance chip cool, air is pulled into the casing through the perforated base through special channels to guide it to the chip's thermal module. But Apple says even under intense workloads, the studio runs very quiet and is barely noticeable. On the back, you'll find all the ports you'll need to create your own studio workstation, including surprisingly a couple of USB-A ports, which Apple is clearly listening to their users' needs here, which is great to see. The Mac Studio can be configured with either an M1 Max or M1 Ultra chip, and with the former you get two USB-C ports on the front for easy access, and on the latter these are both Thunderbolt 4. With either version though, there's an SD card slot on the front too, which is great to have. To go with this new Mac, Apple also announced a brand new display called the Studio Display. A 27 inch 5K retina display with 14.7 million pixels, 600 nits of brightness, and P3 wide color all in an aluminium enclosure. Apple says that it has thin borders, which they kind of are, but not really. I definitely would have preferred them to be thinner for sure. But it does pack a bunch of useful features into the all-in-one design to keep your workspace tidy including a 12 megapixel ultra wide front camera, bringing center stage to Max for the first time, plus a bunch of speakers and mics all built in. And it even has its own built in A13 chip to power center stage and spatial audio, which is pretty neat. It has three USB-C ports on the back for connecting storage and other accessories too, plus a Thunderbolt 4 port so you can connect a display plus all of its connected peripherals to your Mac using a single cable, keeping things clean and simple. While it does have True Tone to gently match the colour temperature of the display to the room that you're in, it doesn't support ProMotion 120Hz, which is a shame, but not totally surprising as neither does Apple's top-level XDR display, which would most likely get that feature first. But there is a nano texture glass option for $300 extra, which scatters light to further minimize glare without sacrificing image quality in workspaces with bright light sources. The display has a couple of stand options, a tilt only display with 30 degrees of adjustment and a counterweighted height adjustable stand for $400 more. Or a visa mount option for those who want to mount to a wall or use it in a portrait orientation. And weirdly, these aren't interchangeable after the fact, so make sure if you are getting one that you make the right decision. The Mac Studio supports up to four studio displays, plus a 4K TV all at once, driving a pretty impressive 90 million pixels and allowing for some pretty versatile setups. They showed a bunch of different setups for creatives like music and audio professionals, 3D artists and designers, software development teams, photography studios and creatives working in video editing, and they talked about how the Mac Studio will handle pretty much anything that gets thrown at it. It's clearly an incredibly powerful and versatile machine, and the price does reflect that, certainly at the higher end. The Mac Studio starts at $2,000 or pounds with an M1 Max chip, or 4,000 for one with an M1 Ultra chip. And that's just the baseline price, so the price can rise pretty quickly as you're configuring your storage and memory. And if you're going for the new display option to match, it starts at $1,600 for the standard glass option with the tilt-only stand. So just for a basic configuration of both, that's almost $4,000. And don't forget to add in a keyboard and a mouse and maybe a trackpad too. Apple did actually announce uh, new black versions of these two, which... I'm not going to lie, these look really good, I really love the black finishes. Overall, I think the Mac Studio is really exciting, I think it offers a lot of flexibility for creatives who want to create their own workstation, either with or without Apple's own peripherals like the new Studio display. The performance offered by the M1 Ultra is pretty unbelievable and it makes the upcoming Mac Pro reveal even more exciting, which Apple did tease a bit on stage, saying that that's something that they'll talk about on another day. But I can't wait to see how far these Apple Silicon chips can go in their top level most pro machine. If you'd like to watch the full event for yourself, then I'll be sure to link to it below. But those have been my thoughts and reactions to Apple's first event of the year. And I'd love to hear your thoughts too, so let me know in the comments. 
I wasn't expecting the Mac Studio or Studio Display to be announced, so those have been some nice surprises. And I think that it's a pretty solid start to 2022 for Apple. Let me know if you're going to pick up an SE or the new iPad Air and how you plan on using it, or if you're going to make your own Mac Studio workstation. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.